everyone. Welcome to this webinar on providing primary care for people with complex needs. Dr. Brian Chan will share his experience as the primary investigator for a novel model of primary care for high-risk populations at an FQHC in Portland, Oregon. My name is Gina Lima. I'm a professor for um, the CHF Health, uh, Alumni Network. And for those of you who are not familiar, with the network. Uh, the network is comprised of more than 500 clinician leaders with the mission to improve health and healthcare delivery in California by facilitating learning, collaboration across healthcare sectors, collective actions, and continued professional and personal development of network members. The network is funded by the California Healthcare Foundation and administered by Health Force Center at UCSF. So we're so pleased to have Dr. Pri uh, Brian Chan presenting today. Uh, Dr. Chan is a physician researcher at the Oregon Health and Science University. One of his focus areas is uh, the study of innovations to improve care processes and quality outcomes for safety net populations. Just a couple of logistics. Um, everyone is on mute, but if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat box or go ahead and unmute yourself um, and ask questions. And finally, this session is being recorded. Thank you. Hand it off to you, Dr. Chan. Thanks, Gina. I, I want to uh, thank, uh, uh, thank you for the invitation and also thank uh, uh, Ann and Alan for, for uh, their involvement with my career. And, and, and I, I, I did a teaching session uh, for in a similar audience a couple of years ago. And so really great to be back to kind of share um, what I've learned in, in this process. And so um, I wanted to kind of outline, um, uh, describe Central City Concern and Old Town Clinic, the rationale for developing our ambulatory ICU at Old Town Clinic, um, describe some of its program, uh, Give a, a give a good program description and compare it to our usual enhanced usual care, which you'll see is probably fairly robust compared to kind of a traditional uh, care. And then also detail evaluation plans and uh, preliminary results and findings of, of now three years uh, of our uh, evaluation. Um, and I think you know I was invited to give this talk uh, around March, and then something big happened. And um, as, as we're kind of opening up, I think it's been a good opportunity now to reflect on the challenges um, that COVID-19 has, has brought forth. And, and maybe uh, I really wanna invite participants to share their experiences. And um, you know, I, I come here kind of open-minded about uh, you know, admitting, admitting that our team and, and our experience, our team, our clinic has also experienced challenges and maybe um, getting some ideas from from the uh, crowd today. Um, I think I skipped over this, but I really kind of want to go through you know the goals of the session. Um, by the end, I think hopefully you guys can describe the summit program and the AICU model of care, um, understand preliminary results <coughs> of an ongoing trial, uh, learn more on provider and patient care experiences with the intervention. Um, and then identify current challenges uh, in the time of COVID and, and healthcare plan. So I think Gina, at this point, maybe we can do the polling questions. And as people are kind of filling in these, I can continue on, but I think just to kind of get a lay of the, of the land here. Um, Um, you know, just kind of getting a sense of uh, who the, uh, who's in the audience today. Uh, so a little bit about Central City and uh, my background. Um, so I am a junior faculty member at uh, OHSU, Oregon Health and Science in, in Portland, Oregon. Um, but we have a research and educational partnership with Central City Concern, which is a, um, I think it's a very unique kind of integrated social services agency um, that in uh, downtown Portland uh, that combines 
federally qualified health center sites with integrated primary and behavioral health care, um, integrated kind of social services like housing um, programs. Uh, there are kind of three major housing programs in, 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 in Portland and Central City is, is one of them. Um, there's also kind of employment services and addiction services. And I always like to um, recall the, the, sto the story of Central City was really a sobering station for um, alcoholics in Skid Row in downtown Portland. And from there, you know, developing, uh, understanding their needs in terms of housing, um, addiction services, access to employment, and then kind of meeting their healthcare needs. And um, that's kind of the, 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 the trajectory of, of a central city's uh, history um, where healthcare was kind of at the end um, of a lot of addressing social determinants. And uh, now because of, you know, um, uh, healthcare in America, it's become kind of the largest, but it, I think this, it's really important that the roots are still kind of in um, addictions, in homelessness. Um, and so a little bit about our clinic. Um, you know, we're in uh, Portland, Oregon, a Medicaid expansion state. Um, the clinic is a designated healthcare for the homeless program. Um, again, providing integrated primary and behavioral health care, uh, pharmacy and co-located specialty mental health and substance use disorder services. And so if you've ever been to Portland, it's, it's right in the intersection of uh, Burnside and Broadway, kind of right in the middle of, of, of the city. Um, if, if you've ever been to Portland, it's really near Powell's Bookstore, which is kind of a, kind of a highlight. Um, so so um, we serve over 5,000 patients per year, um, many who have a, a you know, complex medical, behavioral, and social needs. Um, and so you know, prior to Summit, we, we've always felt that we had a robust team-based care with a patient-centered medical home model. Um, but even so, you know, and back in 2015, 2014, mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. there was real realization that, that there were still patients that weren't being uh, uh, served as well as we, we, we thought we could. Um, and so, you know, this is working with Care Oregon. Care Oregon is a Medicaid payer in, in, um, in the Portland area. Um, you know, I think this is kind of around the time of the hot spotters, um, high cost, high need patients, 13% of Care Oregon members for about 52% of paid costs. But for our clinic, 25% um, of Care Oregon members were 76% of, of paid costs. And so I think, um, in terms of utilization, 13% of Care Oregon members had qualified as a high utilizer um, for our clinic, 25%. So I think that just that realization that our, our clinic served a particularly vulnerable population um, and our qualitative experience, you know, just in terms of patients who we would refer to these specialty mental health services or refer to pharmacy, but they weren't showing up for appointments or um, they weren't engaging or, or they would have a hospitalization and you know, get a lot of these post hospitalization discharge programs that are available, um, but still we're, we're not continuing to do well. Um, that um, kind of led motivation to what, what, what can we change or what can we do? Um, I'll also say if, if people have uh, questions or feel free to interrupt. Again, I, I want to try to be as interactive as possible. Um, uh, these just kind of represent some of the diagnoses uh, that we see. And so you see a lot of substance use in, and, and that might be different from your setting, but I think um, um, I think that's kind of the, the kind of gives you a little bit of a sense of, of who our population is. And why an AICU? Um, an AICU for those uninitiated are kind of standalone high risk teams um, that have additional resources and, and really kind of uh, uh, patients transfer their care to, to, to such teams um, and kind of, uh, and that's different from like a maybe a, a care coordination model that works with existing primary care teams. And, and one of the reasons why is that we've already had some of this uh, in place with our mental health, uh, these core and ICM 
These are kind of the ACT model teams for, for severe mental illness. Uh, we have our community engagement program, which is a kind of high risk team for, for, um, for uh, uh, sub severe substance use teams. Um, and so they're, they tend to be integrated or multidisciplinary, low caseload is super important, um, population focused, um, relationships is kind of a, a key um, to these teams. Um, and again, trying to offload some of the pressure on other parts of the care continuum. So, um, you know, our general medical services are here um, and this, this, the summit team was really, the thinking was that it would help offload some of the, the uh, care, uh, the, the usual care teams. Um, and so that plus payer interest in developing new models, um, the initial thinking was doing some hybrid funding with monthly incentives, capitated per member per month, um, fee for service with adjusted productivity, academic funding that, that funded my position when I came on board in 2015. Um, there was resources to allow for a site visit to the Stanford Coordinated Care Model, which is, which is how we, we um, got to know Anne and, and Alan. And, um, you know, kind of knowing that there were no best practices at that time and uh, for, for these kind of populations. And so I think there was a lot of excitement, a lot of leadership engagement in, in team members for design. Um, and so what is, the, what is our team components? And I think this, is, this graphic kind of shows you our model. And the, the, the biggest thing I'll highlight, 200 patients. You know, this is a, this is a provider. Uh, two care coordinators, a pharmacist at 50% time, a complex care, not, care nurse at one, one FTE, um, and two social workers for about 200 or so patients. And, and to be honest, we're, we're not even at 200, you know, basically 150. Um, and really that reduced patient to staff ratio, allowing more time to build relationships, um, outreach, provide timely support, um, increased access to the team and, and smooth transitions of care is, is, is the model. Um, and I'll kind of delve into a little bit more of what that actually means. Um, but this is a picture of our, um, the first iteration in about 2016. This is a team photo um, and, and to give you a sense of that. Um, yeah, and here are some of the core activities that every patient gets. And I think that it's a mix of activities that I think every, every uh, patient would, would receive, but, but also a lot of flexibility to, to kind of tailor to, to different patient needs. Um, but every patient gets a comprehensive as initial assessment with social worker, physician, and care coordinator. This is a two hour intake um, that is, really sets the kind of care plan in place, identify unmet needs, you know, start making lists of like what, what's important to the patient and then building that trust. Um, increased self-efficacy um, with this low patient to staff ratio, the flexible appointments, outreach visits, um, you know, really a high touch model. Um, and, and you'll see with COVID that that's really been impacted um, uh, through, through the kind of high touch model. Um, but really trying to build trust through, through multiple contacts um, being that kind of point of contact for uh, patients and, and the rest of the healthcare system. Um, there's been a, a we, we tried to build this with a focus on reduce, reducing treatment burdens and simplifying care based on the patient's goals. Um, and then again, focus on social determinants of health, um, the social workers involved in patient care from day one and uh, linkages to housing, insurance, and other social services. Um, and you know, even being an integrated social services agency like Central City, I think what what what's important to realize is it, it's still very siloed, um, and uh, that's that's been you know there's still a need for kind of additional care coordination or you know, these types of interventions. Uh, I, I also really want to highlight the investments in the team. Um, so there was early on training in a palliative care and motivational interviewing and trauma-informed care, uh, use of data-driven dashboards and uh, QI management, uh, and then a focus on team wellness. Uh, 
to this day, uh, you know, um, there's a, there, they do a five minute uh, meditation uh, before uh, starting the day. Um, and I think it's, it's a very collaborative team where team members are encouraged to work, you know, to their license. Um, and then the co-location allowing for this concept of psychological safety. I, I think the, people are allowed to kind of take on um, patient care issues and um, it's not just the hierarchical, you know, physician uh, at the top. It's actually the care coordinator. I think that is really the quarterback of this team. And I think that's kind of a, one of the big, big pieces of our model. Um, and so this is a great picture of, a, you know, obviously this is not happening now, um, but this is um, a snapshot of the team room. They, of course, we gave them the closet, the, the windowless room in the clinic. Um, every other care team has windows and it's a bigger room, but, but I think they've really, you know, it's really fostered this cohesion and, and teamness that, um, and this is kind of uh, during one of the Friday panel management uh, where they run, the care coordinators will run their lists of patients, um, get feedback from you know, our physicians, our team manager, our nurse, our uh, social workers, our pharmacist is here too. So, um, And I want to compare that to our enhanced usual care. And I, I put enhanced uh, in quotes because I do think that this is a really robust, you know, I've, I, I've trained in um, the VA, uh, I've trained at, at uh, OHSU, I did a uh, fellowship at San Francisco General Hospital uh, clinics. And, you know, I, I do think that this is a really great model of a pa what a patient-centered medical home is supposed to be in terms of a, we have four usual care teams um, with providers, a, a, a care team manager, a health assistant, which is like a, a clerical assistant that helps with faxes and getting records. And, um, some of these phone calls with patients um, for 1,200 patients of varying complexity. And again, as I alluded to um, Central City, we've got access to you know, specialty pharmacy and diabetes uh, pharmacy management or hypertension management. Um, we have access to mental health care and uh, each team has a, a psychiatric nurse practitioner. Um, and we also have access to, you know, on-site alcohol and drug counselors and screenings. Um, but I, I note this dotted line here is because I think there's always like a little bit of a voltage drop, particularly with those really complicate, complicated patients where they're just unable to, to, to access these services or they, you know, it, it's another re referral, it's another appointment. Um, and a lot of times the patients are saying, well, I, they're not my team, you're my doctor, or you're my team. Um, and that's why they, they don't go often attend to these. And so I think that's, that really speaks to some of the, the reasons why the Summit team came, came about. Um, I'll also highlight this health resilience. This came, on, came online about the same time that the Summit team was being conceptualized. And this health resilience specialist um, is really based on the community health worker model developed in uh, University of Pennsylvania. Um, uh, and Carol Oregon began sponsoring the program in 2014. Uh, these are, you know, the, the initial concept of this was a lay person that helped, you know, uh, outreach with vulnerable populations and meeting, meeting clients um, kind of outside the clinic to help uh, uh, engage with, you know, services. Um, our health resilience specialists have mental health and addictions training um, and are really well trained in trauma informed care and the ability to work across systems. Um, they are, the limitations are, they really are meant for short term engagement, small caseloads, um, and it, it works on a, 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 a physician referral system. And so I think it's a little bit different from the summit team um, because it's, it's short term engagement it still works with the usual care system. Um, but again, um, uh, uh, you know, why, why it's an enhanced uh, usual care. Um, and so this, this, this kind of gives you a breakdown of the differences between um, our, our usual care. Um, and I think this is a really neat, one of our um, summit team members put this together, but just to give you a flavor of like what happens during a typical day. And again, this is a little bit pre 
pre-COVID. Um, but you know, at eight to eight, to, these, these, each column is a different role uh, team member. Um, but you can kind of see what, what people are doing at different times of the day. So provider might be doing a wound care follow-up, um, the nurse is reviewing records of hospitalized patients, the care coordinator is uh, doing a wound care, you know, uh, uh, for another patient, the pharmacy is starting to review data for patients, the team meets at 8.45 to 9 to do the huddle, um, and then people are off kind of doing their work, um, seeing patients, but you might see that um, you know the social workers following up on a disability referral, writing an, a letter of advocacy for an upcoming court date. Uh, you know, next checks in with the provider's 10 a.m. appointment to help co coordinate new caregiver services. Um, the nurse maybe you know accompanies a patient to an oncology appointment, or and then later accompanies a patient to a Nephrology appointment, um, and so so on and so forth. But I think this, uh, you know, this is a really fun slide to kind of see. It just this is so much different from from a traditional kind of uh, care practice. Dr. Chan, we have a question. Sure. The question is: Are you using any particular systems that drive and coordinate all of these activities? Yeah, that's a um, we. So a lot of it is paper based. Um, so some of these, I mean, we, we've got our kind of, we use Centricity electronic health record um, and that kind of gives a template for scheduling. Um, our care team manager kind of sets, uh, kind of sets the schedule each week. Um, but in terms of tracking, um, I mean, we are kind of using whiteboards and paper and pen. Um, and I think that's, that's one of the challenges that we don't really have. Um, until recently, the clinic hasn't necessarily invested in um, you know, some of the software or some kind of project management tools that, um, that, uh, that might kind of, kind of organize these activities. Because these are a lot of these activities are non-clinical, so the, the electronic health record is not sufficient. Um, but it's interesting with, with, with COVID, that the, the clinic has invested a lot in, in pushing out uh, care management tools, um, but no. I'd be curious what others are using if, if, if people want to share. Hi, um, good morning, everyone. My name is Adelia. I'm a process improvement consultant for Sutter. And so here at Sutter, what we do as a lean consultant, we use a lot of the lean methodology, the visual management, tools pretty much like you mentioned a whiteboard or an excel sheet um, to track um, we also try to do the daily engagement system where we uh, incent uh, pretty much coordinate with team members to do their daily huddles uh, virtually uh, for some clinics uh, I personally support the virtual clinics so we motivate them to have their their huddles daily um, before they start and to groom patients uh, schedule so they can provide any uh, or escalate any clinical care that is needed. And then um, we also use um, uh, process improvement um, uh, the problem solving techniques to help them uh, do rapid improvements um, during the day and, and to save those lessons learned so they can share with the team at the end of the week um, what went well and uh, even better if. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I, I will, um, you know, so how, do, how does someone get into Summit? This is someone with advanced medical illness who, who has a difficult time engaging in primary care, someone who might benefit from longer appointments, um, someone who doesn't go to the ED often, but when they do, they're usually admitted for medical issues. And so I, I guess what I like to say is that we, we try to go with People who have a you know meta, big M in terms of medical and may and little substance use or you know little mental health um, and again because we have other teams for for those severe mental health illness we that that was kind of the initial intention um, and this is kind of our refer, our internal referral so um, 
usual care teams might use this referral form to refer a patient who's you know, just having a struggling struggle. Um, so where I came in, and I, you know, full disclosure, I, I am not one of the providers on the summit team. I actually see uh, see patients on the usual care team, and my role has kind of been to kind of be the the observer and uh, an evaluator. And so um, that's kind of where where I here's where I, where I come in. Um, and how do we you know um, show that these work? I think there was this. This, this goal of, hey, we want to be able to do this, but we also want to be able to disseminate it. We want to be able to, you know, show how it works and, and be able to kind of go beyond um, uh, the clinic's walls. And I, and I think uh, this was also, in, you know, during a time where um, Central City, which is great, you know, has a great reputation for clinical care, um, community standing in Portland, um, but really hasn't done, um, been involved with research, um, and we have this great learning lab opportunity, and I think that's kind of where my hire came in and, and where this project really jumps off for me. Um, and so, you know, my, my, my plan was to kind of do this as a, a weightless control, a, almost a randomized control kind of, kind of, kind of design, um, where you know the team very team driven where everything is clinical up until this uh, baseline survey and randomization and consent so you know the, the the team decides who who is accepted and who they want to have on the team and who, who's appropriate um, i i have some basic criteria but again kind of really wanting to be be flexible with the team's needs and and, and the clinic's needs um, uh, really just kind of come in with a research assistant, um, conduct a baseline survey with lots of social determinants uh, 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 questions. Um, patient activation is something that I think um, from Anne and Alan, we wanted to kind of try to assess baseline, whether this, this, this clinic could improve. Other patient reported outcomes like the, the SF12, the functional status and mental health, um, uh, CAP scores, patient experience, those things that we really weren't going to be able to get from um, just a, a regular clinic visit or chart review. Um, that's kind of where I developed a, a survey at baseline and then at six months and at 12 months. Um, and once they kind of filled that baseline survey, then they would kind of uh, open an envelope and see kind of where, when, at what point they would join the intervention. So we did have a six month waitlist control where patients. Um, there would, main, would, would remain on their usual care team and then join the intervention. And it really allows for true comparisons with the usual care at six months. Um, we can do comparisons of individuals pre and post intervention. Um, and so this was a very kind of good design in terms of uh, kind of assessing the, the evaluation, not just controls versus interventions, but um, how, how the intervention changes, uh, patients change over time. Um, it also was really practical for the, our clinic um, because you can imagine if you have, you know, 400 patients, they all can't just join the team right away. Um, there's, there's always kind of referrals that, uh, uh, there's always limitations in terms of who can join right away. And so this was just a way to um, address high demand for limited resources um, and the fact that all patients do eventually receive the interventions. I have another question, um, Dr. Chan. Sure. It is, what is your successful engagement rate for referred patients? Thanks. Successful engagement rate for referred patients. Um, in terms of how, of, of how many patients who were referred, how many, how many people, uh, uh, is that, the, is that the question? How many people actually join the team? Well, I would like to invite Jim to maybe unmute and elaborate. I can only see the question in the chat box. That, that's correct. Of the patients referred to the program, how, what percentage are successfully engaged in your care model? Yeah, that's a great question. I, um, so, you know, in terms of our our engagement, so so we uh, as part of our um, 
as part of our uh, contract with Care Oregon, we are um, we are we are supposed to have three plus face to face encounters with a team member in every six months. Um, and so for for the care or our, our target was 80 percent um, from July 2019 and until you know when we last reported we had um, we actually had 76 percent of our uh, patients had three plus appointments met that criteria um, I have to say that Engagement can mean a lot of different things. Um, and so I think qualitatively, I think it's a little bit lower. There, there are definitely some patients who don't um, in, you know, engage with the clinic in a way that they, I think the team finds meaningful. But in terms of contact, that was a, that was a good um, amount. Now, in terms of people who are referred who start with the team, um, it's a little bit less, that number is gonna be a little bit less because there are people that, you know, they're referred because they have no show to their primary usual care and, you know, actually the summit team can't find them either or the research team can't find them either. And I think that's one of the benefits actually of the research. Um, our research assistant would kind of be, be the one who would be um, finding these patients to try to uh, recruit them for the study part, but also get them involved in the team. and so. Um, you do have a lot of patients who were referred, were accepted, um, but never engaged in the team. I, I I don't have the exact number off the top. I can I will note that down and I can I can talk offline. Get that to you. Um, but this this graph actually kind of reflects a little bit of that. It it took us three years to enroll um, 190 patients. Um, and I think our initial estimate was that, you know, that we would be able to ramp this up quite much faster. Um, this, you know, so of the, you know, of the first 139 patients, I just kind of wanted to give a break, to just some basic demographics. But the, the big thing is that this is really, you know, high poverty, um, low social support. This, this social support measure is out of 100 um, so these are patients who who really um, um, you know, are affected by social determinants. Um, our housing um, homeless uh, percentage is about twenty three percent, and and that's to say a lot of our our patients have already received a lot of high touch services or social services be before coming on the summit. Um, so they might have already received housing benefits or or been placed. Um, and they continue not to do well. I mean, there's a percentage who are homeless as well, um, but but there's a kind of a mix of patients who have already received, you know, been through a lot of case management programs, haven't done well, get referred to our team. Um, this is kind of our preliminary utilization outcomes at six months. Um, the big thing things here is that, you know, at baseline, we're picking the right patients. Uh, these are patients that had, you know, in the last six, in the six months prior to joining the team, two and a half um, uh, uh, hospitalizations um, and three, you know, between three and four uh, emergency visits. They tended to use primary care uh, quite a bit. Um, and um, at follow-up, the big thing is that there were really no differences in hospitalizations or hospital days or emergency visits, but there were increases in primary care for the or in summit team visits for these immediate, uh, the patients who are randomized to summit immediately compared to the wait list. And similarly with behavioral health visits. Um, and then the last thing here is that you can see that both groups kind of, uh, when you take the differences, both groups actually experience, you know, decreases in utilization. Um, uh, however, um, the summit team uh, members had increases in their uh, primary care engagement and behavioral health engagement. Um, Can we have a few follow-up questions? Sure. That's the whole. And, and Jim, don't be shy if you want to unmute and, and get on in this conversation too with the questions so far. Uh, how many patients were primarily non-English speakers? And do you have any pharmacy utilization outcomes? Thank you for these questions. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, you can see here that it's a, a majority white race ethnicity. Um, I would have to say, you know, I, I don't have the number off the top of my head, but I would say that, you know, maybe we have 10 patients who uh, English is not primary language um, and, you know, Spanish speaking. Um, and we have, and one of the providers is Spanish speaking um, uh, as well. So, yeah, I think this is reflective of the demographics of our clinic and um, and of the community at large. Um, although we 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 know that um, you know underrepresented minorities are tend to be have higher rates of, of homelessness um, um, and and have have higher needs. I think that that is definitely something that we struggle with uh, as a kind of institution. Uh, pharmacy data, that is something I haven't looked at. We, we will have data on that, but that's not something I have uh, you know, in terms of pharmacy utilization. But that's a really interesting outcome that we're trying to do now is, is look at kind of medication possession ratios and, and, and pharmacy refills because I, I think the pharmacist role has been very proactive in terms of medication delivery, um, uh, medication counseling. Any other questions? Um, I think one of the things I also really wanted to highlight are some of the patient reported outcomes. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll in particular, the, this SF12, which is, a, which is a functional status, and it measures kind of physical uh, and mental health composites. Um, and you know, I think my initial hypothesis was that this team was going to really improve physical health functional status. And we didn't necessarily see that here in these results. What we did see, though, is uh, in improvements in the mental health scores. And these are kind of out of a, uh, scores out of 100. Um, and you can see kind of a, a pretty consistent trend of mental health, uh, composite mental health score, the role limitation, emotional questions. Um, um, you can kind of see, you know, I, I think it really tells a story that, that something's happening with this team that in these patients that have, you know, severe limitation, uh, physical limitations and mental health limitations that, that the team is doing something. Um, and I think that that's something uh, I really wanted to highlight. Um, and again, it, it does make sense that um, kind of on look back, a lot of these patients are already on, on disability. Um, you know, they're already have a lot of chronic um, osteoarthritis, um, using, you know, having to use uh, uh, walkers or other assistive devices, uh, I, the, the, the ability to improve on that is, might be difficult um, at that point. So um, this is um, our patient experience outcomes. Um, and I think what you see here is communication was statistically significant. All of them kind of have an increase, but this one was kind of the, the main finding. Um, uh, I, I was very surprised that care coordination was not higher be just because of all the activities that the team does. Um, and, uh, but it might be, you know, um, it, it might, might change with, with an analysis of the full results. Um, Patient activation. Um, so, you know, I think this is already kind of, ten, uh, this is a low activated population. Um, and at follow up, there wasn't a kind of clinical increase, you know, about three points, but um, not, again, not statistically significant. Um, and again, I think one of the, the issues that, on reflection is that the, the questions that the PAM asks were very difficult for some of our patient population to understand. And that's, that's true for a lot of those survey instruments. A lot of those surveys that we use to assess these things are not um, uh, super patient friendly. Um, you know, health literacy is a big barrier for our patients. Um, I do want to point out this palliative care measure. How do you rate your health from zero to 10 at six months? Um, and we do, again, see some kind of improvements with, with Summit. So, you know, in terms of the quantitative, what do I take away from that? I, I think that some patients seem to have improved mental health, functional status, reported well-being, and patient experience at six months. 
Um, they definitely had higher amounts of outpatient care engagement, although no differences in uh, inpatient hospital utilization. Um, I do think six months might be too soon for changes in utilization in hospital days. Um, both groups kind of regress to the mean, and that, that is a kind of patient selection as who really would benefit from these interventions. That's kind of the next step of the, what I'm seeing. Um, and qualitatively, and I'm gonna go through that, is it, it, Summit does a lot with social support and patient navigation, and, and I can, it makes sense to me why some of these measures improved and, and others didn't. Um, I'll kind of go through some of these qualitative results quickly, and to, uh, um, but, but I really wanted to highlight, we interviewed uh, the team members, we also interviewed usual care team members to kind of, you know, what is their concept of caring for these patients, and what, what are the processes of care that, that are really important, and what are the outcomes that are really important to, to, for staff members? Um, and I really want to highlight this patient system mismatch. Um, I won't read the, the quotes in the, in the interest of time, but you know, you can imagine that these healthcare systems um, aren't always set up for, for the patients that are on summit or for these medically complex patients. Um, so a lot of what, what this team does is addressing patient system mismatch. Um, the team really important, uh, really feels it's important in terms of building connection. Um, uh, so not just talking about the medical, but also talking about the psychosocial, uh, being present with the patient, um, and you know this really ability to ride through chaos. Um, I was just on a team meeting today where you know they did, did all this care coordination to get this patient to an appointment, uh, only to find out that the that the the, the referring clinic had canceled the appoint or uh, rescheduled the appointment, and so that that kind of is an example of the riding chaos and chasing people down doesn't always happen you know right away that that's that's a typical story for, for the summit team um, you know flexibility in care delivery really trying to find different modes for how to um, address uh, care needs and get them engaged um, this the sense of teamness I think is really also important um, you know hearing what everyone else has to say that's this concept of psychological safety um, and supporting patient self-efficacy. Um, I think, and this is kind of theme seven, theme seven is that the staff really don't define success by utilization, even if the payers or the system really wants to, to, to address utilization. Um, it, it's really the, the, the uh, you know, that's not what's super important to, to these, to the, to the providers. Um, so um, I think from the patient perspective, I'm just starting to delve into this data, but I think there's an appreciation for humanizing encounters with Summit. There's those trusting patient provider relationships that support patient engagement um, and how the team helps navigate challenges to self-management and as well as structural supports. Um, and I think these are just some quotes that I, I, I'm, just now reading, but really kind of capture that. It's, it's nice to see people that know what's been going on and know your background. They don't have to ask you 49 million questions to get to where you're going. They're going. Um, another patient said, I mean, it's, it's kind of the thing where they know who you are. They just know what's happening with you. And it's not like you're just another number. There are a lot of places that you go and that's all you are. You're just a number. This last one I'll, I'll mention um, is, you know, I was 32, I got diagnosed with diabetes, and that's when everything started. And then I got a doctor out in another clinic, and they were okay, they weren't too bad. It was just kind of like, you're diagnosed with diabetes, here's what you need to do, that was it. And when I got here, after my first intake, they did all kinds of different things like food programming, sitting with the pharmacist, going over my medications, understanding what my meds were for, why I felt a certain way after eating certain things or doing certain stuff, what I needed to cut from my diet. You know, I didn't have any of that with my other doctor. My other doctors pretty much was, you got diabetes, look it up. Um, I think current issues, uh, staff transitions. Uh, we, after kind of several years of 
stability with the team. We, we've experienced a couple um, departures and difficulties filling certain positions, particularly this care coordinator position. That's really been a challenge, um, uh, kind of the first major challenge, I think, for this team after a couple of years of stability. Um, we've had some difficulties obtaining clinical and panel management data, and I think um, you know, some of that, um, as, the, as the other um, uh, participant added, you know, we, we, we have been doing a lot of tracking with a whiteboard and pencil and paper, but um, it's difficult to sustain that kind of work. Um, quality improvement activities, uh, you know, I think, uh, and, and continued training have been difficult with financial pressures and um, not being able to kind of invest in the team as much. Um, there is a little bit of perceived loss of leadership support. So, um, um, and, and that might be a good thing in terms of, you know, Summit is doing really well. We've got it in place. It's working. We don't, we need to put out other fires, um, other, other needs in the, around the clinic. Um, but um, yeah, I think there are a lot of challenges that this model has for sustainability. Um, you know, the financial piece, um, there, are, there are calls from our payers that were initially supportive of now, hey, we need to kind of demonstrate, you know, increased productivity and, and what does that mean and how does that change the model? I think that's something that we're, we're struggling with right now. Um, and with COVID, I think everyone's kind of had the same challenge about the lack of PPE. Um, but that's really made it challenging in terms of this high touch intervention, the, the need to see patients and balancing that with the safety of the patient and safety of the staff. Um, so we, we were at kind of at the will of the clinic direction and the clinic policy had kind of a, a blanket policy of no, you know, face to face visits unless it was absolutely urgent. Um, and that applied to the summit team. We have no infrastructure for video virtual visits, so we're doing a lot of telephone visits. Um, and so in-person visits are mainly for wound care, you know, essential evaluation and high-risk addictions. The majority of the team is now off-site. Um, the care coordinator and the nurse are on-site every day, and that's for wound care and hospital admission and discharge care coordination. The pharmacy is on site 50% um, of the time, and the physicians are on site about 25% of the time. Um, there's also this inability to do any type of outreach, so accompanying people to appointments or social ser services. The exception is pharmacy. Uh, they've developed, you know, safety protocols with PPE that are, still allow them to do some med delivery and, and med counseling. Um, and again, from my observation, this tension between the desire for face-to-face -face contact and kind of safety and unknowns of what uh, of COVID-19. I think it's also important to note the external challenges. So social services that were kind of commonly, um, you know, that the summit team commonly engaged in have also reduced their capacity. And so that, that means less ability to take someone to the DMV for, you know, to get their uh, license or, you know, a d disability hearing. Those things are, have become either virtual or um, haven't happened because they're kind of quote unquote non-essential. Um, and so, yeah, the, 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 that work has now gone away. Um, and, you know, with that and the financial picture of primary care, it, that's, that's also been kind of a, a big challenge uh, that I've been thinking about. Um, I think some of the impacts on the staff, the, the behavioralists now do more counseling with clients uh, with the telephone and, care, and, and, uh, and more care coordination with other services and less case management. And I think that was something that might be actually be beneficial because I think the initial conception of this model was that it was it was going to be more counseling, uh, a mix of counseling and case management, and sometimes it was more case management and less counseling, and now um, they're, they're actually able to do some counseling. Um, there's a sense that everyone is a little bit less busy. Uh, I, I put that in question marks, um, but you know, phone visits generally do not take as long as in person, the one hour appointments. Um, not everyone is in one, one room, and so we're using Microsoft Teams for daily huddles and chats, and I think that has been really strengthened. There, there's been really focused on that. 
Um, and there's a sense of more quality work, um, ability to get more people housed or higher quality care coordination in particular. Um, at IA. We're, I'm looking into that at this time. Um, but yeah, we, we definitely struggle as probably you guys have with struggling with who should be seen in person. And for some patients, the phone visits actually have been that avenue for engagement that wasn't there prior. So back to Jim's question about who's connected and who's not, actually phone visits work for some patients. And I think that as an opportunity for how we uh, reform the payment structure and model. So I think I'll stop there. Um, but I, I, I think that I, this has been a really great project for me. And I, I think in reflection with, with everything that's going on in the, in the last couple of weeks, um, that, that I do, the mission of these AICUs, I think, is to kind of, to, to, to really correct structural, uh, uh, try to correct structural barriers to, to, to healthcare and self-efficacy. And, and I think, um, you know, that, that's kind of the mission that a lot of our members also feel. And so, you know, I think that this work is very important. So I appreciate um, listening and attendance and I'll take any questions. Brian, this is Alan yep. Glassroth. The, the, uh, I just wanted to tell a little anecdote from a site visit I did. Both Anne and I have done site visits since, uh, since the program started. Um, you were having a, uh, an issue or the, the team was having an issue because your little um, room without a window where the team meets or used to meet was on the second floor, but the entry to the clinic is on the first floor. And uh, it's kind of a daunting entrance. It almost looks like uh, downstairs, it resembles trying to get visit your family in jail a little bit, you know, with plexiglass and, and people standing in line. The, the, uh, what, what you guys had found out is that the patients figured out how to bypass that desk, get to your little room and knock on the glass. And I, I, I just remember a discussion where people were saying, well, maybe this is the new way that patients register or, or, or check in for their visits yeah. or, or get their needs met. And to me, having that flexibility to think like that is what distinguishes patient-centered from delivery system centers. So I just yeah, want to thank, talk about Thank you for that, yeah. I'd be curious if other people on the call have, are running similar programs and are they having similar changes? I mean, that, that's one, one thing I hope to get out of too is, you know, any suggestions for, for our program um, or in general to, you know, I think this is really challenging stuff in terms of making it sustainable. Um, you know, I didn't talk about it, but, but how did, you know, um, I think, great, you've done, the, you know, I think the, great, you've been able to do this at Central City. Um, can it be applied to other settings? I think that's, that's something I think about all the time. I, I do think about, you know, in, in terms of our current payment model or what changes we need to happen to make this more sustainable where, you know, a one hour visit at this point is treated similarly to a 15 minute, you know, visit. Um, uh, you know, that, that makes it really hard for sustainability, so. Here's if other people have run into the same questions or same problems. Hi, Brian. This is Peter Curry. Um, I appreciated your talk and uh, and that question. What we found was that we had been building our own uh, clinical registry and EHR because we couldn't find anything on the market that actually supports team-based care and this kind of um, you know, team delivery. Uh, there certainly are those that support multidisciplinary episodic care where you refer to other folks, but our model was having much like that picture you showed, a team in the room that did treatment planning together um, and was and is presented much like you described with the uh, care coordinator as the quarterback 
So what turned out to be very valuable for us was having invested in that clinical registry to support the uh, kind of model that we do, transdisciplinary care. And then uh, seeing that pivot using video and telehealth uh, to be able to continue to treat patients in that kind of unit-based care where patient could be part of a group or a cohort that's treated uh, by the same team, same day, same time. And so what was different for us is we couldn't disperse our team to their homes. So the team comes and sits six feet apart with their masks on and deliver care as a team to patients who are now um, on a video platform or telehealth. And that's been a very powerful learning experience uh, for us to be able to, to pivot to see transdisciplinary care able to be delivered um, in an age of COVID where you can't necessarily see the, the people. So we're, we're kind of excited to see what comes of this in the future. We think that for some patients, they wanna be seen and they're getting tired of the uh, distance. Um, for others, this has been you know, a lifeline for them to be able to continue to be able to be treated by the team that's in clinic, even though the patients are at home. So anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there that a uh, lot of parallels from what you were presenting and um, you know, having the software to support transdisciplinary care really was the key for us in making that pivot. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Peter, for that comment. Um, I'm trying to think about what we, we're using this, the, the, the whole team uh, clinic is using a uh, you know, kind of clinical registry and I forgot what the program, it's coming to my, it's not coming to my mind, but yeah, I think that's, I'd love to talk more about what you guys are doing and how you use it. And then this whole vi virtual visits where the team is, is, how that works, that, that is something I think we're really interested in. Um, I'm reading some of these other, I just looking at the comment box. Uh, it's, um, yeah, I, I agree with Shelly, uh, the question about using PAM and other functional assessment tools, it, it, it really is important to what tools are most effective to capture the responses. Um, yeah, and I, I, I definitely agree. Um, you know, I, I think the, the, the Camden trial that just came out in the New England Journal and earlier, uh, you know, one of my colleagues wrote a response letter to that, but just it didn't capture the, all the other things that happened, you know, starting a registry for these patients, getting people connected to housing or food, food, uh, uh, um, food resources. I think those are really important things that didn't get captured in that evaluation. It may color what people think of these interventions. <clears throat> Um, do I think outcomes will be stronger when assessed at 12 months? That is really a good question. I, I think I think we're going to be able to do that, and I'm really that I, I do think so because I think the the concept is um, that again that 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 high utilization is is sometimes a it, like a chronic disease. It takes time uh, to kind of de develop new habits, and I think this team is kind of enforcing kind of new routines. How to engage your care? You you want to come come to us first before you do anything else, or use this, or here's this resource. Uh, um, and so, I'm going to be excited. I think the the trial, will, the kind of last patient, will kind of complete their year follow up in November, and I think that's when we're going to be able to kind of see the 12 months, um, and maybe some data 18 months. It's going to be harder to see at 18 months because again we we have a six month um, that, that's kind of our control is for six months and, and uh, it's, it's gonna be harder to kind of make, draw conclusions at 18 months. Um, mental health improvements are promising. Uh, has this led to any changes in your outreach or in what you are measuring? Yeah, I think we're definitely hype, you know, not hyping, but I think we're we're definitely emphasizing those 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 behavioral health uh, changes uh, much more. And I think when we go to our, um, you know, present to our payers, we're really kind of, I, I think this is an opportunity to kind of change that model. I mean, we 
we actually just lost our, you know, maybe the next iteration of this model is less medical uh, doctor uh, staff and more of these uh, licensed clinical social workers. Um, you know, that, that's kind of the things I'm thinking about is like, if, if, that's the, if that's the benefit, maybe we should have more, you know, retool the model to, to meet that. Um, and uh, so, so yeah, uh, for sure. Um, I think the other question. Brian, was, this, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, the you know, I I just think you're under you know, 200 people isn't a lot, and and there were positive trends in a lot of other measures, but not sufficiently powered to be statistically significant at this point. I wouldn't abandon the medical side of this. There, I, I wrote up, but Caremore did a, a similar study to what Camden did, though it got a lot less publicity. Um, and, and they actually did achieve significance with very similar model to what you're doing, lowering ED visits and admits. I just think you don't, you're not powered to see it yet. Your trends are positive. Right. Yeah, I, I agree with that. We are at one o'clock, so I encourage any last questions while we have Dr. Chan on the line here. Okay, well, with that, thank you so much, Dr. Chan, and for and Lindsay for finding you and coordinating uh, this this session today. Yeah, thank you, thank you for the opportunity, and uh, uh, really great to to present. So I appreciate the opp opportunity. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye everyone.